What's going on guys, Skit Gaming here, and today I'm finally going to address the metaphorical elephant in the Blackhawk. <coughs> Ever since I uploaded my last review on this game, people who can't grasp the concept of the passage of time flock from every corner of the internet to whine and complain in the comments. Skit, what do you mean they remove parachutes? Just push the G button. Skit, what do you mean there's no lore? Just talk to the guitar man. Skit, it's a good thing that the NVGs were rendered useless, because it's more realistic. Dude, you commented this while I was training with Nods in Morocco, and I can assure you that they're able to see more than 8 feet in front of you. After the veritable avalanche of comments asking me to give this game a second chance, I've decided to extend my mercy to Blackhawk one more time. After all, I am a generous god. All jokes aside though, they did patch up a lot of problems that I took issue with, and we're going to talk about all that and more on today's skit review, Black Hawk Rescue Mission 5 Revisited. For me, the biggest change since Operation Resurgence is the addition of friendly NPCs. All of the checkpoints, cities, and bases feel much more alive now, with soldiers patrolling around and civilians chatting in the refugee camp. Sacrena City, which used to be a ghost town that nobody visited on purpose, is now buzzing with activity as people walk through the streets, buy things from the market, and interact with the UN garrison. The UN forces are situated around the city by country. Brits and Americans can be found in the harbor, the Aussies guard the north checkpoint, and the Russian forces hang out in the inner city. They've also reworked the hostage system. Now you can get hostages to follow you into vehicles and transport them to the refugee camp for a reward. This brings me to the next major change. Quests. In the last video I complained about the removal of various forms of income. The helicopter at Alchara and the mysterious duffel bags at the radio tower serve as alternate ways to make money that help to break up the monotony of traveling to a location, shooting some guys, and then waiting to shoot more guys. Specific NPCs in Sokrina will have you run odd jobs for cash, experience, and even guns and accessories. These quests come in four major forms. Direct action, where you go somewhere and shoot people. Recon surveillance, where you take some photos and then shoot people. Collect and deliver, where you spend five minutes driving from point A to point B, and then sometimes back to point A again. And search and rescue, where you collect NPCs and transport them back to safety. Because no video will be complete without some kind of ranking, I will now rank the quest giving NPCs from worst to best. At the bottom of the barrel we've got Major Nyquil. He's called that because he only offers collect and deliver missions which will inevitably put you to sleep. What does he offer in reward for these tedious tasks? A foregrip and a British uniform. Disappointing. Next up is Isabel the Innkeeper, who sometimes sends you to go annihilate some RLF troops in retaliation. After her is Petro, an RLF deserter. The only reason he beats out Isabel is that he has more direct action quests and one of them involves lighting up the Ronograd police station with an M2. Next is my man Graham Cracker, who offers a wide range of unique quests and has the second most item rewards of any quest giver. In second place we have the Russian, who gives the most rewards. Plus 10 points for being the only NPC to give you a gun. Minus 20 points because it's a Groza. Finally, in the number one spot, we've got Sydney Nguyen, who is conveniently situated at Sakrana spawn point and gives the only quest that's actually challenging. If you've played this game, you know the one I'm talking about. Since I hadn't played Black Hawk in a long while, I can't say for certain which of these features were added after Resurgence and which ones existed the whole time but flew under my radar. A major problem I've noticed with the vehicles is that they have a much more violent and unpredictable spawning process. I bought the M-Rap because I thought it looked cool, but I sold it after half an hour because it would spawn in a way that made it unusable 90% of the time. This could entail the wheels spawning under the ground and dragging the vehicle into the earth. It could be the vehicle itself getting stuck in a wall near the spawn point, or it could mean the entire truck got express shipping to China after being flung into the heavens. This affects quest vehicles as well. There's a quest given by the British guy that I've never even seen because whenever it starts, the delivery truck spawns underground. Through my extensive research and experience, I've found that the 4x4 is the best form of transportation. It can fit two players with hostages, or five without, it's the fastest land vehicle in the game, it has the lowest chance of failing to spawn, and you can turn it into the base mobile by painting it tan, taking the roof off, and mounting a 50 cal on the back. The vehicle weapons are still hopelessly underpowered. No game should require you to land five or more hits with an M2 Browning in order to kill somebody. Also, every window on every vehicle now has this annoying, obtrusive glass texture over it. I could maybe see this kind of wear and filth on the windshield of a Humvee, but an aircraft? Come on. 
I fly around with my canopy open so I don't have to try and squint through the glass any more than I need to. They've also added a camera to helicopters that can be operated by the co-pilot. To end this section on a good note, I'm pleased to announce that most of the A-10 issues I addressed in my previous review have been resolved. The prohibitive cost is still in place, but I can sort of see the reason for that now with the role the A-10 is intended to fill in this game, that being a final endgame toy that maxed out players can have fun with. I still have two major issues that pertain to the A-10 in particular. The first is that I want some sort of health indicator. The helicopters have readouts that show you your whole integrity, and I'd have much more peace of mind if the A-10 got something similar. Maybe you could put it over the useless missile control screen. My second issue is that the A-10 is not tolerant to rough terrain on takeoff and landing. This makes a lot of sense at face value, but it becomes a problem when the runways at the airfield are covered in lights that jet out just enough to kill your plane if you happen to strike them. I have lost at least $15,000 as a direct result of these lights. It makes me paranoid to try and take off, and landing is completely out of the question. I'd very much appreciate if they made these lights non-collidable so as to avoid any more tragic runway accidents. Oh yeah, the uh, parachute's back too. I'm a tree meister, king of the trees. It's time to welcome an old friend of the channel back to take us into the rest of the video. A big round of applause for the one, the only, Timur Glaskov! I would normally see details, but I am a new man and more than a one trick prne. Skid is covering a lot of things that don't fit cleanly into one category or another, so the section will be labeled miscellaneous. Thank you for your time, Glass Out. Thanks, Glass. We still got a lot more to talk about, so let's not waste any time. The map is much more fleshed out. Locations have been made larger, more detailed, and more interactive. Just look at the glow up that the Department of Utilities got. It used to be one of those dead zones on the map where nobody visited, but now it's enormous, filled with enemies and hostages, and still a dead zone to be fair, but also a lot cooler now. Even Alchara, the most frequently visited location in the game, was made more detailed and harder to attack. They also added background ambience that changes depending on your location and the time of day. Speaking of which, I feel the day-night cycle is a bit too fast. The sun's only up or down for about 8 minutes at a time, which gives you just enough time to travel to the location and take it. It'd be nice to be able to do more than one thing per day. The enemy AI has been drastically improved. Now instead of walking slowly towards you while shooting from the hip, enemies will take cover and move around. The different types of POD provide different challenges. For example, the smoker has more health than the average grunt and will sprint at you while releasing toxic gas. The enemy factions also get some characterization that they didn't have before. The RLF is clearly less well equipped and garrisons most of the western locations. While the POD is more dangerous and holds many positions of tactical value, such as the fort, naval base, city hall, and comms tower. Sometimes, like at the Department of Utilities, POD and RLF will work together to defend the same place. There still isn't a whole lot of incentive to raid certain locations like the power plant. It's too remote for convenient hostage transportation, and if you wanted to farm enemies, then Alchara and the City Hall are much closer to your spawn points. I think adding more items like the comms tower duffel bags would sufficiently motivate players to raid these locations. The new menu features a revamped loadout system that shows you what attachments are without you having to click on them, as well as making the UI fit the style that the rest of the game enjoys. There's also a 3D deployment map that allows you to spawn at the airbase, Sakrina City, or or Ronagrad. Not only does it look cool, but it also makes it much more convenient to get where you need to go. A big quality of life improvement is that you now spawn with bandages, dressings, and vitamins already loaded in your IFAC. This way, you can't forget to grab medical items before going outside the wire. Unfortunately, the same treatment is not extended to grenades, flares, and flashlights. They're literally on the next folding table. Why can't we spawn with those as well? The NVGs are fixed. No longer will you need to strain your eyes trying to make out shapes in the splotchy blackness of the night. I sometimes even wear my nods in the daytime, because things can still get pretty dark, especially if your clothes or vehicle are green in color. Finally, I didn't play much PvP since coming back, but from what I've seen, the system is much more reliable. I don't think I've had any instances where I failed to join a match, and the queue and loading times are almost insignificant. As far as the maps go, I've noticed that some of them have been changed to enable better PvP. In my last video, I ranked the gym map in last place, but now it's got plenty of walls and obstacles that prevent spawn killing and encourage bolder tactics. 
Overall, I'd say that Black Hawk Rescue Mission 5 has significantly improved since my previous review. Most of the flaws have been corrected, there's more content to be enjoyed, and the universe has been expanded. For these reasons, this game has earned itself an updated score of 8.5 out of 10. Hey, Outro Skid here. Shout out to Jersmy V, Jersmy 5, that guy, as well as JackieBoy676 for teaching me the quest system. Also, shout out to Jeffy Watt doing 4, aka Zerg, Saturn Levi 6, Diego 77 Proc, and Marcus XD500 for helping me get some B roll. That's all I gotta say for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Skit Gaming signing out. Goodbye.